Yeah. Uh, okay, let's see. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, dear Father, we all hope that you welcomed all the nine people who were slaughtered last week in Charleston into your heavenly kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, last week we were covering forgiveness, and by some dreadful, dreadful error, I failed to bring up the key passage, the key story in, in the New Testament about forgiveness, the prodigal son. So we have to get that out of the way before we embark on a new and exciting subject for the rest of the evening. All right, you'll know how it begins. A man had two sons. Now, by the way, um, have my children got their inheritance yet? No. How do you know that they don't have their inheritance yet? You're still, you're still alive. I'm still yeah. alive. <laughs> yes. Just imagine how I would feel if my kids say, can we have our inheritance now? Oh, I'd say, spend over while I put on my kicking boot. Um, but anyway, that's just a little reminder of how nasty that would be. Anyway, a man had two sons. Here's the man. Ah, uh, we'll put his, we'll put his, uh, some of his expressions on later. There he is. He doesn't say tell he's a man. He's got a beard and everything. All right, there he is. And then over here, this is his son. Now, we'll add the mammals later. The man had two sons, and the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of your estate that should come to me. I love it. Let's say right now, your share, your share is zero. Um, Madam in the front row that was looking for the famous, uh, there, there yeah. he is. And I see an envelope. Okay. Um, so you just never kind of the kind of mystery intrigue that takes place. <laughs> I can say no more. Um, so it says the father divided the property between the two of them. And I love it because the father, now, you know, most fathers would probably say, um, you're too young, you're too silly, you're too immature. This, it would be the wrong thing for me to, to give you what you ask. But no, no, the father says, all right, you can have your inheritance. And it says, so the father divided the property. After a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and set off to a dis distant country. Now, what kind of a mood is the son in right now? He's got his million dollars. Oh, look. So happy. And how, how does the father feel now that his son said, I can't wait for you to die, hand it over? Sad. 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 Yes. Sad. Poor now, tell me this, who is the son thinking about? Himself. Himself. Oh, yes. who's, the, who's the father thinking about? Yeah, he's thinking about his son. <laughs> he feels bad too, but mostly for his son's sake. Um, now, I, I, I love the son because he has, say, a million dollars. He didn't do anything to earn it. So I figure he has tons of self-esteem, no self-respect. And so he leaves. And remember, you remember from, from prior, from prior uh, classes, uh, what, does a, what does a little baby think about 24-7? So himself. Yeah, yeah. So, so this young man hasn't progressed that much from his baby, his baby to. He is still 24-7 thinking about himself. Hurt his father's feelings. He doesn't care. Just give me the goodies so I can get on with my fabulous life. So that's what he does. He went to this distant country where he squandered his inheritance on sex, drugs, and rock and roll. When he had freely, even sixth graders understand that. And when he had, when he had squandered it all, all his inheritance, uh, a severe famine struck the country. He found himself in dire need. It's like, okay, so where are all his friends now that he took a million dollars? Just like this, take a million dollars, put it in the toilet, yes, gone. It's like, now what? You blew the fortune, the whole nut is gone. Where are all his friends? They're gone. They're gone, they're gone with the money. The doofus, he didn't have any friends. Oh, now how does he feel? It's like his dad. So <laughs> and look, <laughs> he's crying happy tears. Oh, he is so miserable. Yes. And it said, 
he hired himself out to one of the local citizens who sent him to his farm to tend the pigs. And remember, if you're a Jewish person, this would be like worse than the lowest. I mean, you know, even the New Testament, even Jesus says, don't cast pearls before swine. Oh, nothing's worse than that. Even a dog is better than a pig. Yeah, so he had got to feed the swine. He longed to eat his fill of the pods on which the swine fed, but nobody gave him any. And I loved this when I was a kid. Um, some of, part of my family still lives in Springfield, South Carolina, and I had this kind of a nut, not nut, but offbeat, let's say, uncle called Uncle Broxy, and Uncle Broxy was never married. He lived by himself in a little trailer, and <laughs> when the trailer was like, this is his trailer, and like the door was right there, and then back here was a, a three-side fenced enclosure that he kept pigs. And so one day I was down to visit and says, oh, come on, go to Uncle Brox. He's going to go get all the slops to feed the pigs. So he, I went with him, and he goes to all the little the, the schools in Springfield, like two or three little schools, but he was going, got all the leftover foods. It was in these big plastic buckets. And it was all just every bit of everything. Everybody just stunk to high heaven. It was milk. It was orange juice. It was all the uneaten food, everything. And he throws it on the back of the truck. So we drive out to his place and stand up on the little side of the fence, and he's got the trough. And I'd never seen this before. And, and so he dumps all this disgusting slop in there, and the pigs just went crazy. Wow. Like, <laughs> so I mean, just, you know, they just loved it. And anyway, so I always think, I always think, especially with the kids, is 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 imagine imagine wanting to eat that because I've been saw it up close. And I thought I would never be that hungry. But you, know, you don't have anything. I guess you get that hungry. What a just terrific image wanting to eat what the pigs eat. Anyway. So he came to his senses. How many of my father's workers have more than enough food to eat? But here am I dying from hunger. I shall get up and go to him and go to my father. And I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would one of your hired hands. Now, obviously, that would be a big improvement over where he is now, being the hired hand of his, of his father. Now, he knows one thing, though. How's he going to pay his father back that million bucks? He can't. So first thing he does, he realizes he's sinned. Now, who is he still thinking about? Himself. But who else is he thinking about a little bit? He's thinking a little bit about his dad. Yeah, it's primarily because my daddy can do me some good, so maybe I love him after all. But it's an improvement because he's not going to go back and wheedle. Not going to go back and wheedle. He's going back. He admits his guilt. He has learned something. He has committed a sin that is so awful that he realizes that at long last he needs to repent. Which actually, that always reminds me of my tennis shoe lie from last week, I think it was, is that thank you, Jesus, that I committed a sin when I was 12 years old. It was bad enough for me to recognize that I was a dreadful sinner that hurt other people and that, and that I needed to repent. So I always think of this as like, this is his tennis shoe lie moment. He's, he's got tapped down to the bottom. He's realized that he has hurt his father and he's going to do something. Now, love this is he, he kind of examines his conscience. Because he says, I will go to my father, and I will say, Father, I have sinned against you, and so forth and so on. So he got up and went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and went and got his Louisville slugger so he could beat his butt. Now, <laughs> this is what many fathers would do. Is that what his father did? No. no what did his father do? He ran out and embraced him. Yeah. So the father was still thinking about his son. How does the father feel now? He is so happy. Yeah, even though his son threw him, flushed a million bucks of his down the toilet, he's still happy to see his son come back. I just love it. It's so sweet. He's filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Now, his, his son says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. He confesses his sin out loud to his father. He has a physical encounter with his father out loud, both in spirit and in body. He confesses his sin. He repents of the sin to his Father in spirit and in stuff. It's that physical encounter, just like with Jesus. Jesus never forgave anybody's sins without a physical encounter. So it's the same thing. That's why Jesus is telling this story this particular way. And the Father, remember the Father lets him confess. The Father doesn't say, oh, dear, you don't need to, you don't need to, to, to say a word. I love you so much. No. He lets, the Father lets him confess because he needs to confess. Because truly, can, can the Father, and this is true for any parent, and I'd say the same thing for me, is can a parent truly forgive a child until the child says, I'm sorry for what I did? I mean, you can kind of conditionally say, I won't 
I won't punish you to death for this, but you know, if you say, you can't just say, I forgive you, and then Junior just runs off and plays his video games. You have to have that, the child has to participate in that transaction. And for all the parents, including God our Father, does, does God get something, does God get something compelling or that something he has to have to assuage his pride by having us, or in this case, having this son confess to the Father? I mean, the father doesn't need that for his own well-being. He, he, he insists that the son, he lets the son repent and confess at last for the son's good, so the son knows that he's done it. I said the words. I feel humiliated. I know I'm repenting. And then the father says, quickly bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fatted calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a feast because the son of mine was dead and has come to life. He was lost has been found. And remember now, let's say that the son had, here's the love-o-meter. Here we go. There we go. Okay. <laughs> love goes this way and time goes this way. Now, let's say that when the son was living at home, he was he was at a 50 on the love-o-meter with his father. He loved his father just fine. You know, his father always took care of him. It's like, yeah, he kind of whatever. Isn't that his job to take care of him? I'm worth it. All right, then he, he leaves and hit the love of me. He doesn't know if his father is, can do anything for him all and he's scraping the bottom. Then he comes back. Now, he repents. Where, where is he going to be on the love of me after the repentance? Pick a number. 80. There, I picked it for you. He's up at 80 now on the love meter He's getting the finest robe. He gets a ring. He gets a fatted calf. He gets all these goodies because he's had a change of heart and he's repented. And, and part of it's out of self-love and part, part of it's out of love for his father. So he's operating up here now. Let's see. On the love meter he is an 80. And now they're having this party. And it says this, now the celebration began. Now the older son, who had been out in the field busting his butt all day long for his father, <laughs> was on his way back, and he neared the house. He heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants. What might this mean? The servant said, your brother has returned, and your father has slaughtered a fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. So, <laughs> oh, dear. There's the brother. He's kind of old, too. He's not like a kid anymore. Oh, boy. How does he feel? Angry. Oh, he's so mad. <laughs> oh, he's so angry. <laughs> now, who, who, is the, who is this son thinking about? Himself. He Myself. loves himself. What about me? I never got a good deal. I love the way he plays into his father. Look! All these. I love it. His father comes out to him. Oh, dear son. Instead of just saying, says, I don't know. He wants to be a pain in the butt to let him stay out on the porch. No. He comes out because he is thinking about his he's thinking about his son. Now, let's assume at this point that since he's up at an 80 on the love meter, he's learned his lesson. And now he's just so it's just like the love relationship with them went up 30 points because the offended party had the offender have a change of heart and repent and say so out loud. So their love has grown just from the fact that the son had sinned and sought repentance. Now, the other son. All these years I served you, did not once did I disobey your orders. You never gave me even a young goat to feast with my friends. But when your son returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes and drugs and rock and roll, for him you <laughs> slaughtered the fattened calf. I love it. He is just, he is so upset. Now here's the thing. And of course the father says, look, my son, he says, you're, you're here with me always. Everything I have is yours, but we must celebrate. Your brother was dead and he's come to life. He was lost and now he's found. And it's like the older I get, the more I plug into this son. Because um, I love him. Because number one, here's what I think his problem is. Two problems. One of them is he doesn't think he's been bad enough to repent for anything. He says, I've done everything you wanted from me. It's like saying, I'm the next thing to perfect without saying so. You should be giving me all the goodies, not him. And, and the father would like to do that, but I think he's also jealous because he realizes now that his love, he's still at the 50 on the love of meter. His brother, who the great sinner, the disgusting sinner, the wastrel, has a change of heart and tells his father he's sorry, and all of a sudden he sees their love increase, his, his reward increase, the kind of the, the, the mutual love that the two of them sharing that he doesn't participate in now because he doesn't, this is his chance to tell his father, 
oh my goodness, it, you know, I, I have to, you know, I, I haven't really done everything you always wanted to do. I'm so sorry the times I've let you down. I mean, you know, and just focus on, well, you know, all these occasions when you were generous to me and I wasn't generous back and I really haven't loved you as a, as a really good son should have. And his father would have said, oh, you know, I love you too, darling. Let's all have a big group hug or something. But, you know, no, he wants to stay out. No, 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 no. He just wants to think of himself. It's like the classic, it's like my favorite, my favorite Bible story. Um, it's just so sweet because the father always thinks about the children and even if they want to flush their wives down the toilet, he lets them do it. But if they sin against him, it doesn't matter how much, no sin is so great that it can't be forgiven. What could be a bigger sin than, than, than Junior here flushing a million bucks down the toilet? I mean, that's like off the map, especially as far as this son is concerned. Anyway, a dear little story and the kids use it all the time. One reason I especially love that is this is a great model for confession. The first thing you have to do is realize you've sinned. That's always my problem. Well, I haven't really been bad enough to go to confession. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, you have. Um, and you, know, you realize you've sinned, a change of heart, repentance, and then a physical encounter with the Father who says the words of forgiveness that go out of his mouth into your ear, and that's the way you know you're forgiven. That's all available to, to this son, but his pride keeps him from, get, from, from doing this. I'm not, I'm not so bad that I need forgiveness. And that's how the story ends. It's so sad. Anyway, so I got that out of our system. And now we can get on with the subject matter of this evening. Uh, let's see who can read this. Kids usually get this. How about so far? Oh, y'all yeah, are good. It gets hard. Nothing but confidence. Yes. yes. Oh, this happens like maybe every other year in sixth grade. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Nothing but consonants. Here's why I bring that up. Is um, about. Let's see. I have to read a tiny, tiny bit. This is from uh, 2004. I thought I was going to lose my mind when I read this. An archaeological discovery in 17, 1979 appeared to be the earliest biblical passage ever found in ancient artifacts. Two tiny strips of silver, each wound tightly like a miniature roll, and bearing some little inscribed words were found uh, outside Jerusalem. They were 400 years older than the Dead Sea Scrolls. Anyway, it says uh, one of these little silver things is four inches long and an inch wide, so it's about like this. And they might be a little bit big. A tiny little thing all rolled up that somebody probably wore around their neck. And they say the handwriting, and it was, a, it was the little thing from Numbers, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and may the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and all that. It was written down in this little, little amulet. that said the handwriting is an early style of Hebrew script that had all but ceased to be used after the destruction of Jerusalem. Words in, in, in New Hebrew would have included letters or marks indicating vowel sounds. In other words, it, 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 we, we could do something like a figure A E I O U was one two three four five. You know, right here we might put a a, a, a four, and that, you know that that's an O sound, and this would be a two, letting you know that's a that's an I sound, and that you, your vowels wouldn't exist as letters per se; they would just be little marks, like in Arabic or in modern Hebrew, that tell you how, how to make sense and make a word. Anyway, it says that that the this was written in words. It's spelled entirely with consonants, the authentic, archaic way. And the reason I bring this up is, for you know, up until the Middle Ages, just about all languages just wrote everything in just long streams of, of letters. And at least in the West, you know, we had vowels. But even like if you try to read something, like I can read some Latin, but it's very difficult if I'm trying to read like medieval Latin because I can't tell whether where the, the words start and stop. It's like difficult. And for, for Hebrews, when everything was written in consonants, it was even more difficult. Remember, there was no printing press. So that if you were a scribe or a Pharisee, you know, you, didn't, you couldn't walk around with your very own Torah. The dog and the thing cost $50,000 or something. So people, for two reasons, memorized enormous amounts of scripture in Jesus' day. Number one, they didn't have a book that they could run around with. So their memory had to be good. Number two, the only way to know what the book said was to have someone sit down with you who already knew what it said and go over word for word with you while you sounded it out and he would correct you. Or we would say, no, it's like this. Ah, oh, it's like that. Because a person couldn't just sit down and just read 
things like this indefinitely and, and, and know what was being said, especially like in the case, remember we covered this tri 